So I, I think a lot going on in this race, and our guest today I think is going to help us sort through it. Uh, Jen O'Malley Dillon was most recently Better or Works campaign manager. She moved her family down to El Paso. Uh, because she believed uh, so much in in Beto and, and the promise of his candidacy. Uh, Jen is someone who's got a, a long and storied career in democratic politics. She served as the executive director of the Democratic National Committee, has run statewide campaigns, was uh, senior leadership at John Edwards' 08 campaign and was his Iowa state director. Then we brought her into the Obama campaign. She led our Battleground States program in 2008 uh, and served as a deputy campaign manager for President Obama in 2012. She is as good as it gets. And really, for the first time, you know, she will get to speak about the race a, a little bit unburdened because she's not speaking on behalf of a candidate. So I, w- I want to spend time with Jen talking a little bit about, you know, what happened uh, in El Paso and with Beto's candidacy and why, you know, the potential he had wasn't able to be realized in vote support and financial support. Um, but then move on to her view of both the primary and the general election. And I think we're all going to benefit from her observations because she's someone who has, you know, been in the arena each and every cycle and knows these states inside and out. So we're so thrilled to have Jen O'Malley Dillon, one of the most talented operatives in either party in the country operating today. Jen, thanks for being with us. So glad to be here, Pluff. Well, so we're going to talk a lot about the race, but I want to start with, okay, you were living in Washington partner in a firm, husband, three kids. What caused you to decide to pack up and move down to El Paso, Texas? (laughs) That's a great question. (laughs) Um, You know, to be, (laughs) I get asked still a lot about it. Um, You know, to be honest with you, obviously I had and have a great life. I had the opportunity to start a firm that I really loved going to work every day, doing work I loved. But I, you know, I just felt like where we are in this country, I had to answer to my kids and to say, what did I do to stop Trump? And that really was the driving feeling. I didn't expect to go back on the campaign trail, um, but I randomly was in Texas for uh, South by Southwest. Beto was there at the same time. Um, You know, I'd obviously spoken to lots of presidential candidates. And at that point, I had said, you know, I'm going to help anyone I possibly can. Um, You know, so every uh, candidate has a, a great shot here and spent the time with him. And, you know, part of it was just timing. Um, My son was a little bit older. He just turned a year. And I just felt uh, a really strong connection to Beto. I felt like uh, he was someone that really represented the kind of leadership I thought it would take to take on Trump. I really respected what he did in Texas, but also how he talked about uh, people and the grassroots movement that was at the heart of what he was able to accomplish. You know, he really built an incredibly diverse coalition, and I thought that that was going to be critical uh, in in 2020. And also, um, the biggest takeaway I had when I talked to him was that he really listened. You know, he wasn't trying to sell me. He wasn't making a pitch. You know, we had a real conversation. We're of the same, you know, age generally similar places in our lives, although I'm not an elected official um, and not running for office, but, you know, just felt like a a connection. But also I thought his type of politics doing things, not the the way conventional wisdom or or D.C. dictates um, was what it was going to take this time. And and so, you know, sat, had that conversation, went home, spent time uh, with my family and and just decided that we could make this work and, you know, that I had a unique skill set to do campaign work and I would have always regretted if I didn't do all I could to try to stop Trump. So that was really, you know, the essence of it. Right. Well, it's, I think, great, you know, lesson for people out there that to follow your heart, right? And, and I think particularly in this time, folks need to answer to what they did. So the other thing I think that's so admirable about your decision was it's not like you were joining a sure thing. You know, despite all the attention Beto received in the Senate race and his gifts and, you know, his fundraising list, you know, clearly a big long shot from the beginning. And I think it's really important to understand that. But, you know, what, as you kind of look back at the race, it seems like in the very beginning, I don't know if you think this is fair, there was a sense that maybe Beto didn't enter as strongly as he could have. Mayor Pete kind of emerged. What's your sense of, and again, I don't think this was ever a case where like Beto had a clear shot at the nomination. I think it was a huge underdog affair. But um, what's your sense of kind of what blocked you from getting the momentum you hoped? You know, I think it was a lot in our control and and also a lot out of our control. I I think you're right. You know, we came in with really high expectations. I think we didn't get off uh, to the start that we had hoped. Um, You know, we were dogged. 
you know, both from some of the early media articles, but also, you know, this sense that we weren't showing up and spending the time being transparent with the national media that took us a long time to to rebuild, you know, and then, of course, you had Mayor Pete that he was uh, starting to come on the stage at the same time we were having some of those early struggles. You had Biden getting in later and, you know, frankly, has withstood and and held his numbers far um, more significantly and longer than I think many people thought, you know, and so I think all those things really hurt for us on the front end. And as you're saying, you know, many people just assumed uh, that we'd be coming out of the Senate race and that you would just be building off of that foundation and grow. And certainly he had a national profile. But the depth of his support was really Texas, also California. Those were our two uh, key areas. But you know, as well as anyone else, that you can't actually take one campaign and just translate it into the another. That never that into the next one. That wouldn't have worked mm-hmm. for um, President Obama. You know, we always said that 2012 had to look and feel differently than 2008 because it was a very different campaign, a different electorate, different um, opponent. And I think that one of the early stumbles that we had was that we were trying to build on top of you know where we had left off in the Senate race. And um, that really was a challenge because what the Senate race was trying to accomplish, building volume to get support to do something in Texas and nobody had, is a very, very different challenge than running for president, having early state campaign strategies, going for a delegate approach, thinking about the targeted elements of that program versus, you know, sheer volume. And so it really took us some time to get our sea legs. And by the time we did, um, you know, some of those early challenges plagued us for a while. Um, You know, and again, like I said, some of this stuff, we certainly looking back, you know, there's always things you wish you could do differently or or better. Um, And some of it was really the atmospherics um, of the race. I, I will say, you know, when we came back on the campaign trail after what happened here in El Paso, um, you know, going dark for a couple weeks and, you know, really, I think, kind of a, a key pivot for us in the race. Um, you know, we were very strong. We had an incredibly strong third debate. Um, you know, I think really were appreciated as a candidate who not only um, was honest and direct about the issues he cared about, but but really showed the kind of leadership that he would bring to the table because that's what he was doing when he was in El Paso, you know, tried to and was able to beat Trump at his own game on on Twitter. Um, But yet still, even coming out of that strong period and having just really, uh, I think, such strong um, reinvigoration for the campaign and for Beto, we couldn't translate that into end state support. And I think one of the largest challenges, and this is probably worth a podcast in and of itself, uh, is the fact that polling really is driving all of the viability in this race. And and that's driving towards de- the debate stage. And you and I well know that um, very few people are watching the debate, but the narrative coming out of the debate is critical. Uh, and when that is being dictated, by whether or not you've reached a threshold that keeps growing. You know, we're basically making choices about who our candidates are before voters have the opportunity to vote. And really what we found over the course of, you know, coming out of this strong September um, and going into October, September happened to be the strongest fundraising month we had, um, you know, again, really felt like this this growth of support across all of our channels we were seeing. Um, but October, we couldn't capitalize on that. And some of that was because of the polling. We basically went a month without any national polls. And we were sitting at one. We had three polls the week before the cutoff deadline um, uh, in September uh, that would have made us uh, viable for the debate in, in, in November. But instead, people were starting to question our viability because we hadn't actually made the debate stage. Right. So again, a lot of that's on us. Um, but you know, really, I think those are the kind of things that every candidate had to navigate, and, and us in particular. Yeah. So I think far too many candidates stay in races, particularly presidential races, long past uh, their expiration date, right? And so I admire people who see the reality. It, it may not come together like they thought and, and decide to get out. So you guys, what's interesting is you were planning to attend the big Iowa LJ dinner. You had signs. You were building, you know, the organizational strength. And then, you know, Beto decided, you know, right before really to decide not to run. Bring us into the room a little bit how you guys went about that decision. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, so first I would say, you know, Beto really 
um, is someone who just feels like it's so important to be honest with his supporters and his, um, you know, and and people in general and, and transparent. And so ultimately, when he made the decision that he wanted to get out and needed to get out, he didn't want to linger or, uh, you know, convey something like, you know, going to the LJ dinner and, and making his case to Iowa caucus goers when he knew he wasn't going to stay in the race. And so that ultimately um, determined the timing. You know, I think we really were not sure what was going to happen. Obviously, we had been tracking how many polls would be between uh, now and uh, that period and, and the 13th, which was uh, today, which is the deadline for the November debate. You know, we knew that there was about six or seven polls out there. We knew four of them uh, were polls that um, were national, which was our strategy because we just weren't moving the needle on the ground in the early states. So two of those four polls, uh, we had hit viability threshold previously, uh, two we hadn't. Um, and so we were looking at that. One of those came back and, and we didn't hit viability there. So that was telling us a little bit. Um, you know, on top of that, we were really looking at our finances, obviously, and so much of this stage of the game is about whether you have the money to do and run the campaign that you want. And we certainly could have gone longer uh, and and also, you know, obviously have to contemplate what does it look like if you're, um, you know, cutting down overhead. Um, we really had been pretty streamlined for a long time because we could see some of the financial uh, challenges that we were having. Um, so, you know, we sort of had that as a backdrop. We, in fact, um, I don't know that this is actually uh, well known, but we even explored some initial conversations just to see about uh, the matching system and whether that would be a viable option for us um, to just replenish and match uh, the funds that we had so that we can continue longer. You know, so we really tried to exhaust the the options we had before us, but ultimately it was a decision based certainly on on finances and resources. It was also a feeling that you know. If we were going to continue forward, we would have to really significantly cut down staff. We would have to acknowledge that the likelihood would have been that we would not be on the November debate stage, uh, and that would continue to impact us. Um, and that, you know, it was also, um, you know, part of the challenge was the national conversation, impeachment, you know, what was happening uh, internationally, that was really driving down attention and focus on the presidential race. And so there really was so much less oxygen in October than there was even in August. And that had an impact on us, the down-tiered uh, candidates. And we just didn't feel like there was enough for us to push our reach, to do the kind of advertising at the level that we would really be able to move the needle. And so all of those pieces came together. But ultimately, he made the decision and made it on Thursday night. Uh, we had all the plans to be in Iowa. Um, you know, we thought about maybe doing the announcement at the JJ, but, um, you know, ultimately didn't feel like that made sense. And so he wanted to continue and show up in Iowa because he had people flying in. We had thousands of our supporters there. And he felt duty bound to tell them himself, even though that was hard for for everyone involved right well very tough 48 hours but uh i think you guys handled it exceedingly well so you built a really talented team um some of those people were obviously from the el paso area a lot moved there like you did and i think that's a testament to you people were inspired by beto but they wanted to work under your leadership you told me you're doing one-on-ones with every single member of the staff from the most senior to the most junior what are you trying to accomplish with those conversations well, you know, first and foremost, I want to make sure that people stay in the fight. Um, you know, the the talent, the people, the heart, the passion um, that are part of, of the staff that we had. But as you know, any campaign, you know, these are the, the best that we have as a country. Uh, and I, I just want to make sure that, one, I can offer um, – my thanks directly to everyone. You know, when you have people out in states, uh, you don't always get to see them as much as you want. And so I wanted to be able to do that. But two, I want to make sure that if there was a way that I could be helpful to any of them, that I could do that. And I, I feel like, you know, often this process is is confusing, right? What's the right job? How do you think about transferring to a different campaign? Should they think about Senate races or down ballot? Or, um, you know, what about uh, different organizations? And 
so, you know, my hope in these conversations is to thank folks, to be a good sounding board, and then to help uh, encourage them to to carry forward this and to know from, you know, all of us, and Beto has said this to all of them too, that we hope they do work for another presidential candidate. We hope they do uh, continue on in, in whatever way they can, that, that, that actually isn't, you know, making a choice against Beto. It's actually continuing to to fight for and, and live up to um, the work we did here. And and really, we've been trying to encourage people to do that. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's been an incredibly rewarding experience. And I just, you know, when I am not as hopeful as I want to be about this country, I think about all of the staff uh, from, you know, the, the entry level to the most senior that are out there on all these campaigns doing the work in an incredibly difficult environment and a really hard cycle. And I just feel confident that we're going to find a way forward. Well, I hope, you know, ultimately this is going to come down to one person in our party. So I hope all the other campaign managers who who come up short follow your example and and do the same. So I'm really eager to talk to you because maybe for the first time in the cycle, you can pontificate a little bit, but not as a pundit, <laughs> but as a practitioner who's, you know, been in the field and in these states you obviously know the country well. Um, you, you know you have a unique, I think, perspective having been a state director in Iowa back in 08 for John Edwards. So I'd like to start there, like what's going on in Iowa? And if you're, you know, interested in this race, um, what should you be paying attention to right now? I mean, for me, the race is still early there. It's very fluid. Historically, things break late there, but there does seem to be some patterns emerging. But I'd just love to hear you talk about what you think is going on out there. Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's actually going to be... Uh, uh, awesome to observe this and not have to you know worry about it. I'm like <laughs> right. gonna get, like be a normal person and watch the huh. debate, or I, I guess normal people don't watch debates. But um, you know, to be honest with you, I I think that this race has really flipped my thinking on how you run presidential campaigns on its head a little bit, in part because of the sheer volume of candidates that we had this cycle, how strong they all are. Um, And, you know, we believe, I know you and I believe, um, uh, and I've heard, I know you talked to Paul and and Mitch about this too, you know, really uh, a presidential campaign is a state-by-state exercise where you're building local campaigns, certainly outsized importance for the early states, Iowa at the top of the list. That's certainly no different now. However, I think a lot's change. And I think that we're seeing the impact of that. First, even in Iowa, who where you have the most sophisticated caucus goers, the most sophisticated voters, I believe, in the country because of, you know, the attention they get, the access um, they have, the um, importance that they take their role. You know, there is still uh, a lot of what they are making decisions about um, coming from the national media. And, you know, if you think about that, it's 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 obvious why you have a decimated local media. That's no different in Iowa. Um, You know, you have uh, a 20 plus person field and everyone is trying to find ways to uh, narrow this down, kind of cull the list. Um, and, you know, the conversations that are around the kitchen table are often driven by by CNN um, or by, you know, any of the other programs. And that's not a knock on them. It's just the reality that I think has changed how you have to play Iowa. And I really felt like, and I do feel like, you have to have an inside and an outside game there. Whereas before, I really felt like you could do the work on the ground. You could build the strength uh, of your organization. You could have some key pivotal moments moments and then just be ready to, to grow at those last, you know, six to eight weeks when this thing really breaks. And I, I think that's still true, but that's not the only way to do it. It's a big but change. I, you know, I think yeah. looking at the crew now, you know, it does feel like the top tier solidifying. Um, you know, I think there's really very little um, difference between, you know, the recent polling, uh, obviously Mayor Pete at the top of the list uh, at the most recent poll. I have been really impressed by the organization uh, that Elizabeth Warren has built on the ground. You know, she her team there is very strong. They're just doing the work every day. Um, and I think that that's just been apparent, um, you know, from, from the start. And they've had the capacity to do that. Um, you know, I think that ultimately, as you're saying, I, I, I was surprised, though, I, you know, it should really be no surprise that people haven't really solidified their support. So even the folks that are locked in to their people aren't 100%, you know, locked in. And one thing that I, I 
think it's so important to remember, and certainly we thought about from uh, Beto's candidacy, that there is a lot of people that are just starting to tune in. You know, I remember the days in 07 and 08 where we were saying, oh, high watermark would be 150,000 caucus goers, which would have been the most ever. You guys on Obama team in Iowa certainly were seeing higher numbers and were able to push that number to 240,000. I think we're going to be at that level. And those people that are going to make up that high end, um, that, that growth, they're not engaged right now. Uh, and they're not actually digesting information in the same way. And those are the folks that are just every day, a few more are going to tune in. So I think there's still room for a couple more twists and turns uh, before we get to the caucus. Right. So you guys must have thought a lot about this when you're managing Beto's campaign. But do you think that is it likely, and, and I'm not talking people who are still in the race, I'm saying the day after Iowa, who actually could be the nominee? Do you think that that's still going to be, is it three, is it four, could it be five or six, given how fluid this race is? Do you have any sense, and, and I know some of that depends on the ordering of who those people are, but what's your sense of what this race looks like post-Iowa heading into New Hampshire? Yeah, you know, I was super bullish um, earlier on that there were going to be at least five tickets out of Iowa, in part because of the previous agreements around absentee caucusing, which uh, are no longer the case. But I think that one of the big differences that will have a real impact is the fact that you're essentially going to have, you know, what I call a popular vote, right? Uh, Raw percentages of support in addition to the delegate numbers. And I think that means that instead of just having three or four people above viability, you're going to see, um, you know, the kind of support folks have across the state. And I think that that means that there are more tickets than traditionally have been out of Iowa. You know, Martin O'Malley, I think, probably would have gotten 10 percent or something. That wouldn't have changed the outcome of the race. But that's a much better thing to get than zero delegates. So I think we're underestimating the power of that. I think it's it's definitely um, going to be important to think about the ordering and clustering here. Um, you know, I felt like five tickets in part because I think you're going to have the top tier and it's really going to matter, you know, where that movement and that order is, although I suspect it's going to be pretty close. But then you're probably going to have someone that is coming up from the bottom and is showing some momentum uh, in a way that surprises people. And I think that that will be another storyline that could carry now. Can you really carry five or six storylines out of Iowa? It's tough. But if you fast forward to, you know, New Hampshire and with what I'm reading, um, you know, Governor Patrick uh, might be getting in. Uh, Obviously, that might change how we think about New Hampshire. You have Bloomberg on Super Tuesday where he's going to make his his whole play there. I think that you could certainly see if one person's carrying momentum for those early states, you know, you're going to have history dictating uh, the results here. But if if not, and it, it's a pretty uh, clogged group, you could have three or four or five people moving. And, you know, I think that all that tells us is that the likelihood here, uh, even though history tells us differently, is that this probably will go long because I don't think there's going to be an incentive if there really are five or uh, so candidates that are moving across the early states and then are looking for the big prizes on Super Tuesday for really any rationale to get out unless they run out of money and they can't go forward. So I want to follow up on that and then get back to some of the individual you know, states in Super Tuesday. So, you know, there's an argument that the longer the race goes on, the better ultimately we are for it because our nominee gets tested. We build up organizations in all the battleground states. You know, the flip side is, you know, we've got an incumbent president out there in Trump who's starting to run a pretty robust general election campaign already much less where we'll be, you know, in Q1 of next year. So where do you come down on that? Is there a sweet spot? Is like, let's sort of, hopefully this is over in April. How concerned are you about this going into the summer? Yeah, I'm definitely concerned. You know, I I sort of always... uh have a worry about just the bread and butter infrastructure that is needed to be equipped for a really strong general election. And when you go too long in the race, it becomes hard to focus on that. You know, Hillary certainly was focused on that, was able to do that. But but even still, those precious months, um, you know, of putting people on the ground of figuring out how you're going to work with the other campaigns and, you know, thinking about the leadership and the strategy and the structure 
that stuff takes time. So, you know, at the same time, definitely agree we need someone that is incredibly tested. And we've seen growth from our candidates from the beginning of this thing. And we're going to continue to see that. Um, And it just might be that it just takes a little bit more time for people to really get their heads in a good place about who our eventual nominee is. Um, But I think that it's really incumbent upon us uh, as a party to find a way that we are doing. And, you know, I know you're a part of some of this. There's obviously work that's being done to try to take on Trump. And I think that's critical. That same type work has to be focused on the less sexy part of our uh, readiness uh, campaign, you know, to build the infrastructure. I think this is a place where the Senate uh, can really drive this. But, you know, if if we're going to be playing in places like, you know, Florida and Georgia and, and Texas um, and Arizona, some of those places we've never really played. We have only had maybe a head fake or, um, you know, we haven't had the sort of infrastructure that you need. And that really takes deliberate thinking, uh, thoughtfulness, conversations, and then a way that you can really hand off some of these things to whoever that nominee is, because they're going to need to replenish their coffers. They're not going to have time to be building up their tools on their own. And, you know, you well know that's a place that we need to do more work on. So I'm definitely concerned about it, but I think it can be solved even if this does go long by really driving to build the infrastructure up uh, without a nominee so that it can be handed over at that time. Right. Super interesting. So you think there may be five, six tickets coming out of Iowa, even if a couple of those may be in the caboose, but they're, you know, they're alive. Uh, what do you think the race looks like post-South Carolina? So if Mike Bloomberg ultimately does run, he's sitting out there to make his stand on Super Tuesday. Do you think we're looking at two, maybe three tops people really alive with a chance of the nomination coming out of South Carolina? So, yeah, I, I mean, I would say, sorry, I'm I'm stalling here as my brain works a little bit more slowly these days than it, it has before. <laughs> but, you know, look, I think there's there's probably um, there's a few things that I, I would think about, you know. It, it really obviously depends the makeup of the candidates, but you've got a lot of candidates that are trying to make South Carolina their firewall, right? Biden is doing that. You know, I, I expect if um, Governor Patrick's in the race, he would consider that a place where he could really be strong after New Hampshire, which, you know, he has more name ID. Um, so I think you could have, um, you know, candidates that are starting, you know, maybe didn't do as well in the first state of those, five, you know, but of the five or six that actually are moving around uh, with with South Carolina. So because of that, coming into Super Tuesday, I actually think you're probably more in the three or four range. That'd be my gut. At the same time, I think it's really interesting to explore, um, you know, what Mayor Bloomberg's campaign could do to Super Tuesday, because if, if his focus is really just on Super Tuesday, he's going to be able to spend certainly more money than anyone else that's in the race, I, I would assume, um, but really be incredibly diligent in those uh, different states. I mean, we're talking, yes, Texas, we're talking California, but the things that are really interesting to me are the Oklahomas and the Arkansas and the Tennessees and Virginia's of the world, where, you know, we certainly know that um, the name ID for a lot of these candidates isn't that high, isn't that high, even though we'd expect, you know, nationally they are. Um, there isn't that depth of, of, you know, focus on the race in those states because, you know, they're certainly not getting the attention. You've had a couple of these places where a few candidates have gone in. Um, but ultimately, there's just a lot of work to be done there. And the money will help from a standpoint of both advertisement but also organization. You know, and let's not forget, candidates got to get on the ballot. Um, You know, it was no mistake that Bloomberg is talking about and getting in last week because that was the deadline to get in for Alabama. Um, You know, Virginia is coming up. Uh, Places like Indiana and Illinois have some tough, uh, you know, um, rules that you have to work through. And I know you talked to Berman about all that. So, you know, I, I think that there is a chance that this is so muddled that you still have three or four legitimate folks. You still have a couple of people that are hanging on saying, well, why why would I get out? I have these kind of regional pockets. Um, and I think that there is uh, really going to be uh, ultimately the Super Tuesday states will be driven as much by, I think, probably where the national narrative is as much as anything else. And we saw that in Texas as well, because I just don't think campaigns are going to be able to do the work that they need to do to have the depth of the organization. The right. one thing I'll add is, um, you know, interestingly, and, you know, as we're going through this uh, shutdown experience, um, you know, we're working with a lot of campaigns, whether it's 
transitioning leases for our offices or, um, you know, trying to work through getting our staff uh, on board on other campaigns. And um, the Warren campaign has been hiring up in Super Tuesday states uh, over all the others. Um, And so, you know, that just says to me what I saw in Iowa. They have a very strong organization. They're thinking ahead um, and they're trying to maximize some opportunities to put people on the ground. You know, we're certainly going to see more of that with Bloomberg, but haven't seen as much of that with the other campaigns yet. Yeah. So let's talk about that. And, you know, that must have been part of your calculation uh, in terms of Beto ending the race was even if you thought you could put together the resources and stay on the debate stage in the early states, you know, you have to have the ability to transact those states in March and April the money in the organization. So you mentioned Warren and above all the others right now seem to be placing folks there. Um, You know, you've been through this before. I mean, talk about that because I think even candidates who might exceed expectations in February in the four early states, maximizing that from a delegate standpoint, if you haven't been on the ground doing vote by mail programs, putting staff, doing advertising, like that momentum can dissipate. So it's interesting to hear that Warren's starting to place people there, Bloomberg will, and I think a lot of people listening to this podcast, you know, might not have worked on a presidential campaign. They're interested in it. They're contributing. Maybe they're volunteering. So some of the strategic questions here about, you know, this is not a static process where you win Iowa or come in second in New Hampshire and all of a sudden, you know, you've got organization in, you know, Arkansas and Illinois. So how important is that to be watching? Meaning candidates who don't have the resources financially or the human resources in these states who are really thinking about delegate acquisition down to the congressional district level, you know, folks who aren't, I assume, can't be the nominee. Or is that too harsh a a comment? No, I I'd actually, I don't think it is. Um, you know, I, I think there's some part of the system that forces your hand a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that much about Amy Klobuchar's operation, but, you know, I know how strong she is in Iowa, less strong in other places. You know, that's a, a candidacy that, you know, if she's one of the five tickets out, you know, because she's the sort of first right now in the last poll after the top tier, you know, what does she go on to? And is she on the ballot in Alabama? Has she been doing um, the petitions by congressional district in Virginia? You know, those are, I think, real questions that I think uh, show whether, you know, you have viability. And I think, you know, honestly, um, the the fact that you have a delegate process in some of these states and a, a petition gathering process does help you kick the tie get a sense of your grassroots organization, get you familiar on the ground. Certainly, we're seeing different strategies. You know, I know um, Vice President Biden has strong endorsements um, from another number of candidates. So in Texas, um, you know, VZ has just come on board helping to build out his operation there. I suspect he's going to use his political support and try to work through that network to give him strength in Super Tuesday states. You know, I think some other campaigns will certainly have to have a more targeted approach. Um, you know, I do think it matters showing up in these places, not a- as a candidate before you get to further down the road. Certainly that was part of Beto's strategy. Um, you know, I don't think it is because it's, you know, it's like Iowa, you got to show up for respect or New Hampshire or, or they'll get a chip on their shoulder. But I actually think just to start getting the wheels turning and getting people to say, oh, I know who this guy is. I can remember we did um, an event after one of the debates in Nashville and we had, you know, over a thousand people show up, which, you know, was a really great crowd in a place that we hadn't been before. And and we really deliberately focused on uh, making phone calls to recruit people instead of doing just texts or, um, you know, uh, emails, although we did those things, because I wanted to make sure we were starting to have conversations in Tennessee. Uh, and, you know, what we found was that a lot of people showed up because of that conversation. They really couldn't believe that we were calling them. And we also found that people didn't know who Beto was. Now, he only had 60% name ID, and that really has dogged us a bit because, um, you know, people expect that everyone knows who he is, but the reality is that wasn't true. But we were able to have more of a footprint that really surrounded that trip that allowed for openings for voter contact and volunteering, allowed us to do some of the political work, and just gave us a starting point um, to build our list so that we wouldn't have to go in and wait until we got past the early states. So I think that that kind of is you know, how I would approach this and building the foundation certainly seems like what Warren's doing, um, You know, again, Biden doing that a little bit more through the political side. But it becomes very, very challenging to try to run the table or even have a decent presence 
because of the sheer volume and the size of Super Tuesday states without starting now and before now even. So let's talk about the Bloomberg scenario. So, I mean, I think history shows you don't become the nominee by cheating the calendar. So, you know, the Bloomberg folks have said if he's going to run, he's going to skip the first four states. So even though history suggests that generally those kind of, I don't want to call it a gimmick, but trying to cherry pick the calendar doesn't work. I understand that decision. You know, he just doesn't have time to put it together in these early states. But what's interesting to me when you think about that, so you can point it out, like he's going to be hiring staff, he's going to be running advertising, he'll be on the ballot, he'll do vote by mail programs, all those things are big advantages. But the, the reality is, as I look at Bloomberg, I mean, for him to have a chance at the nomination, my sense is that means Biden has probably underperformed and maybe he doesn't win South Carolina, he's out of the race. But if he's underperformed, almost certainly Mayor Pete has overperformed, so he's still alive. Maybe you have both Warren and Sanders. You mentioned maybe there's a Klobuchar or Harris. But it's hard for me to see, because I think Bloomberg or whoever's our nominee is going to have to win probably the plurality of the African-American vote. Like, How do you evaluate that? So yes, I think Bloomberg's got strength financially. He's got a good team. I think they'll be super smart about how they handle it. But the reality is, um, it seems like there's some pretty strong barriers to him becoming you know, a credible chance to be our nominee. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I, I, you know, I mean, I think from a starting point, you know, we've certainly seen with Steyer, you can get in late and have enough money. I mean, you know, what, I think he spent 50, 40, 50 million uh, at this point, made the debate stage, you know, didn't do badly for himself. Um, so, you know, moved himself into three or four points so that he would qualify. He continues to have the money to be able to do that. Um, but does that actually get you to the top? And and the answer is probably no. Um, you know, I think that the real worry I have is how much money uh, and how much time to just focus on those states and not be distracted by the early states. He'll have to build a foundation. But it is not enough, certainly, uh, I believe, and as you're saying, um, for that alone to be the thing that would, would you know, catapult you to the top. Um, you know, I, I think there's always a soft spot in this country uh, for business leaders. Um, you know, certainly Trump is is part of that, though other reasons, of course. Um, and so I think that that gives you something, you know, certainly he's also um, not just a traditional billionaire. You know, he's been a mayor. He's also someone who's been fighting on guns um, in a way that, um, you know, I think hasn't really built his name recognition, but gives him some places to get some goodwill. Um, but you're right in terms of the base and and uh, you know the the hardcore elements of our party that are putting together a winning coalition. What I think more than anything is, you know, this does less to move him to the top as it does to just drag this thing on longer. Um, because I think that it just means, you know, potentially at its best case scenario that you have another player uh, who's playing significantly who can run the table uh, in a way that you know does that get him to to you know fifteen or, um, you know, uh, hard to know. But if there's question, as you're saying, if Biden hasn't uh, lived up to what he needed to do in South Carolina, um, you know, Bernie's certainly going to stay in this thing. Um, You know, there wouldn't be incentive for him to get out. So, you know, I think it ultimately means then actually the later in March states and April states probably have more value um, than we're currently thinking about them. Uh, and, you know, those coincide with some of our battleground states. Wisconsin, um, you know, is one of them. Uh, you know, so that just, again, means you got to be able to play pretty wide and think about how you're doing that right now. And there aren't too many campaigns, even at the top, that have the ability to do that at the moment. Right. Well, it's interesting whether you're, you're Bloomberg. Um, I know there's, you know, Michael Bennett's Bullocks. There's people who Fairly or not, you know, there's some observers who think would be strong general election candidates, but the big challenge is, you know, how do you find a way through this primary, you know, which is super complicated. So at some point we'll have a nominee. Listening to you, it sounds like maybe um, you think it may not be till very late. I hope it doesn't go to the convention, but maybe we go all the, all the way through the calendar. Have a really short general election then with Trump. You know, you obviously have worked in a lot of states through the country. You ran the battleground states uh, program for President Obama. As you look at the map right now, I guess if you were running the Democratic nominees campaign, what do you hope and expect the final battleground map list to look like, where we're really truly contesting it and have a shot to win those electoral college votes? Yeah, I mean, you know, my 
my hope is always to start as wide as possible. And I think obviously the more states in play, the better off we are. You know, that's really tricky when it comes to Trump because of the amount of money he has already um, and the the level of operation that they've just been building pretty systematically, unlike his last campaign uh, over the last several years. So, you know, Whereas in previous elections, um, you know, I remember when McCain jumped out of uh, Michigan, for instance, you know, like two weeks before, we had just reinforced our staff there. We were growing people because we just didn't feel like what we were putting together was as strong as we needed it to be. And then he, he drops out of uh, Michigan and we're like, oh, thank God. We don't have to worry about that. We can focus somewhere else. Um, you know, so I think some of that stuff you're always going to think about. You know, I think there's some real questions on places like Texas, you know, Texas. Texas is hard. I think 2018 showed there's real possibility. Um, but at the federal level, the, the infrastructure uh, has not really ever existed here. So in order to put that in play, you know, while, you know, if we can do that uh, for the nominee, that really forces the Republicans to spend big chunks of money on defense in a way that they've never had to do. I think we're going to be really careful that we don't get um, uh, off track uh, and that we're really making sure that we're doing the work in the places that we know uh, are really, uh, really core battlegrounds, you know, and that we're not taking anything for granted, right? I think we just saw in 16, um, you know, that you got to do the work and you can't really, you can't cut the edges, you can't cut the angles for some of these big states and, you know, to play in in a Pennsylvania at the level of a general election operation when you don't have much time to build longstanding infrastructure, you know, it is just going to require a lot of resources and a really thoughtful, targeted effort. And, you know, let's not forget there's more work that needs to be done you know, in places like Wisconsin on um, photo ID and and all the voter protection work that, you know, we did not have to face in the same way in in 8 and in 12. So I would like to say that I expect that the field will generally sit, um, you know, as the battlegrounds that we had always looked at previously. I think there's a question on on a place like Ohio. Certainly there's uh, real issues, as there always is, in playing in Florida because the sustained work just doesn't happen happen year in, year out. So you're really building from scratch there. You know, I think Arizona is definitely um, something that will, I believe, will be in play, um, has a real opportunity to, to be so, especially with a competitive co- um, Senate race there with Mark Kelly. Um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, Georgia is always a bit of a, a tough one. You know, I, I know every cycle we look at Georgia and you can see it by the numbers. I, I was fortunate enough to work for um, Stacey Abrams last cycle, you know, and, and she came close and and you know you can kind of see where the electorate's headed but it still has a ways to go so I think we got to be careful that we're not you know focusing on some bells and whistles based on good PR um, but we're really focused on doing the due diligence to really have the strong programs and the core battleground states and not taking our eye off of places like um, the Pacific Northwest and Michigan and and um, you know Pennsylvania Virginia places that uh, you know we really got to make sure that we get the numbers in. And what about North Carolina? You know, North Carolina is an interesting one. I've worked there, obviously, from presidentials and Senate races. And I think, you know, our theory of the case in 08, um, you know, and again in 12 to an extent, was what we really had to do was change the electorate there. So that was the only state in 08 that we had a uh, turnout and a expanded electorate strategy as opposed to persuasion. You know, I would, that did not work um, uh, previous or, or um, following that. Um, and I, I sense sort of just believe you actually have to do all the programs. I think, you know, I just am not a believer that you can just do turnout or registration without persuasion as well, because you've just got to pull from all three buckets that you can. You know, I think North Carolina certainly has some room for optimism. You know, you continue to see people moving from the Northeast into uh, North Carolina and different uh, growth in, in, you know, sectors with young people that helps to change, uh, you know, the basic default 
partisanship of the state. Um, but it really is such a large state. I think people underestimate that and underestimate the the size and scope of the work that's needed there. I, I actually think that it, it certainly should be a battleground state. Um, but I don't know that we do the tending to it uh, in the way that we do in some of these other places to maintain the level of work that, that we would need to, to make it a little bit easier for us. Right. So let's talk about Florida. You know, you've run statewide races there in addition to your presidential experience. I remember, if I recall, the night of 2012, you and I were hunched over a computer uh, looking at local results there because we had, uh, I think both of us uh, were kind of obsessed with Florida, and we won it narrowly, (laughs) um, thankfully, twice. We see in 16 it was close again. It was close at the gubernatorial and Senate level in 18. So, But you mentioned Florida. I mean, it's not tended to to the same degree you'd like to. I think it's a great Trump state, too, in terms of his ability to register and turn out. But just given that as 29 electoral votes, it does seem always to be close. I mean, I'd love your thoughts on that, because I think that's going to be, once we have a nominee, one of their tougher decisions is, do they go all in in Florida? And just from like the chess match standpoint, how important do you think it is? You know, I I think actually, if you're looking um, at Ohio, and look, I'm not counting out Ohio, but I think that just straight demographics and the direction of the state makes it a little bit harder. Um, You know, the size and scope of Ohio and and Florida are are similar in some ways. Um, you know, obviously, if you have some more of these other states more in play, you know, maybe you could get away with um, getting your numbers without including Florida. But I think that's too risky of a gamble. And I think it's 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 an appealing state for so many reasons. I mean, certainly the size and scope, certainly um, you know the diverse population. Although I think very much people um, often don't understand the um, Hispanic and Latinx uh, demographics of the state. Um, and you know, I, I think look at those communities as a monolith across the country, uh, and think you know you do some Spanish language ads or um, talk about immigration, for instance, and you know, that's that's what uh, these communities are looking for. And, and that's certainly not true across any uh, broad audience. But in particular, in a place like Florida, where you're talking about the Cuban vote, you're talking about the Puerto Rican vote, very different communities uh, in different parts of the state that really require um, a thoughtful approach and a very customized approach. And I think that 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 that's what it takes to to be successful in Florida. And, you know, I think there is, you know, real opportunity still in the I-4 corridor in the center part of the state where you have a lot of growth, you have a lot of sprawl, um, you know, you certainly have seen, um, you know, the, that's what I would call true swing districts. And so you've not really seen, I don't think, um, shift in one way or another on partisanship there, um, though that is the younger part of this the state. You know, I think there's some question about the north, um, the northern part of the state. And, and you know, obviously there's always been strong pockets in, in the urban centers and Jacksonville. Um, in particular. Um, but the reality is that that's where, um, you know, we, we organize less and, and we spend less time on. You know, it is very costly to communicate via advertising across the whole state. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we saw in 2018 was this belief that, you know, as we started to see early voting rolling in in places like Florida and places like Georgia, we were really excited about that because the the turnout was high. But the reality was that that turnout was high, uh, not just for us, but for our opponents. And so, you know, I think that that is a place where over the last few years, I have seen sustained Republican organization on the ground. AFP has just been there and never left. Um, there is much more organization than we have seen historically. And for Frankly, that's just not matched what we've been able to put together in a consistent way uh, across the state. So, you know, final word for me would be, I think you definitely got to play it. I think it's hard. Um, you know, I always think about playing in battlegrounds where you've got to figure out what's the the foundation that you need to lay in order to allow you to make the decision that you can go all in and what's it going to take to go all in. Florida is one of the most expensive places to do it, but it's hard to imagine uh, with a President Trump on the ticket, uh, any Democratic nominee is going to be able to find their pathway without um, significantly contemplating and building something on the ground there. Yeah, it would be a huge bummer to go into October basically with just Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, maybe Arizona, the only states in play. we got to avoid that. Jen, thank you so much for the time. I'm curious. So you're obviously spending a lot of time making sure your staff gets situated and moves on to their next journey. 
you know, you're obviously going to want to spend all the time with your husband, Patrick, and your three kids. But as you look out at this cycle, what could be next for you? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> um, my mother is asking me that as well. Um, <laughs> so you're in good company, Pluff. <laughs> you, you know, um, honestly, I, I really don't know. I mean, you know, I f- still feel that same um answer that I have to give my kids, what did I do um, to to make sure that Trump no longer led our country? Um, and ha- how do I do that? I think, fortunately, there's so many different ways to, to plug into that. Um, you know, at, at the old, end of the day, I really want to do whatever I can to ensure whoever the nominee is, is as strong as possible. I will always uh, be worried about general election preparedness. And, you know, I'm a Democratic Party homer. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be looking for in any way, shape or form uh, opportunities where I can just help and, um, you know, be supportive. But, you know, we're going to be here in El Paso to the end of the year for the kids um, before we switch them back to school again. Uh, and, you know, once I get through the next couple weeks, I'll hopefully figure out uh, what's next for me. But in the meantime, whoever I can help uh, and, and support as we figure this out, I'm, I'm all in for because that's what it's going to take. Well, we won't win this without you on the field. I mean, if you decide to go run Florida, I'll go run Pennsylvania, okay? We'll, uh, we'll go be state directors and, uh, and do our part. You know, Jen, thank you for the time and your thoughts on the race and uh, obviously so admiring of, of what you've done really over the last couple decades, you know, across the country to help Democrats succeed. And I do think uh, we will be much stronger for it in 20 um, if we have your voice and your talent involved. So good luck, though, closing up shop down in El Paso and, and closing out the school year. Thanks, Pleff. And, you know, it is uh, great to be on this and to have your leadership across the board for the party because we need that, too. Thanks, Jen. So it was great to hear from Jen O'Malley Dillon. You know, a few things jumped out of me. One, I I love how she's handling the wind down of the Beto race, um, meeting with each and every staff person, no matter how junior or senior they are to listen to them and and help them figure out that path. I hope that's a a model folks follow uh, going forward because we have hundreds and hundreds of people out there who end up working on campaigns that don't go the distance. And we want to make sure those people find uh, their home in the fight. Second of all, I think she had a great observation that, you know, you used to be able to really just burrow in Iowa and South Carolina, New Hampshire, Nevada, and kind of, you know, almost ignore what's happening nationally. I think her view is that has changed maybe forever. And, and you really have to be not just running kind of an inside game in those early states, but, you know, the outside game of national media, national cable, and, you know, social media chatter is so important. You need that oxygen to help fuel what you're doing in the early states. Uh, those early states are, are not as immune as they used to be to what's happening nationally. I thought that was interesting. You know, clearly Jen believes this fight could go on for a while. I think she made a really interesting point that with Mayor Bloomberg coming in, hard to predict where where that goes. Is he going to flame out or is he going to be the nominee? But it extends it probably because you've got another actor then, you know, starting on Super Tuesday and beyond who's got real resources. So, you know, if, if we leave South Carolina with two to three candidates truly alive, you know, with a chance of the nomination, and then you add Bloomberg to the mix, it probably um, adds to the chance that our nomination fight goes pretty deep, uh, if not to the convention. So there are some positives to that. I think we'll build organization across all these campaigns in all the battleground states, learn more about the voters in those states. But I think given that we've got Trump looming, you know, I, I think a scenario where we might know who our nominee is, you know, by the end of March or, or mid-April, once we're done with those mid-Atlantic primaries, I think would be preferable from my standpoint. So I thought that was an interesting observation. It was also great to talk to Jen about the battleground state map. Clearly, she knows these states well, I think pointed out some of the challenges in, in all of them, but believes that, you know, a state like Florida, even with all of the, you know, strengths Trump brings to Florida, we've got to put states like that in play. We've got to look hard at Georgia and Texas, although I think her view is um, they'll be closer this time. They may be a cycle away. And we really have to, you know, make sure that we have Arizona in play. So I think her view is a view I subscribe to, which is if we really get into the last 60 days of this campaign, and in reality, there's only three or four states that are truly at play. That is a massive, massive advantage for Donald Trump. So, you know, we have to find a way to put, you know, at least six, maybe a few more states in play. And that's going to be challenging because Trump's going to have all the money he needs. He's going to have a much stronger organization uh, than he had last time when it was more of a, a fly by the seat of your pants operation. And again, we're going to have somebody who comes out of this nomination, 
you know, in the famous words of George Washington in, in the play Hamilton, outmanned, outplanned, you know, outgunned, all the outs. Um, and so it's an added uh, added burden, I think, for a nominee. But I, I think Jen's central point is um, we've got to, you know, have as many chess pieces on the board as possible from an electoral cloud standpoint to really have the best chance of winning. So thanks, everybody, for listening and look forward to our discussion next week.